good evening sir yeah hi dr anand good evening so uh, the plan for today is actually today is the last session so i just want to uh, discuss hla b20 sir because there was some request like uh, uh, for uh, a live analysis of hla b27 though it's a very simple assay i just want to show you uh, hla b27 so that uh, it is completed uh, like uh, uh, because there were one or two participants who asked me like uh, we want to see analysis of hla b27 so i'll just start with that it's a very simple assay we'll just finish it off and then we'll go for today's lecture okay so i've already dragged the file so i'll just directly start with analysis okay see so the basic uh, thing what we are going to do in hla b27 is to get the lymphocytes and check whether it is expressing hla b27 protein okay so that is the only thing we are going to do but there is only one, one i mean there is an additional feature is like if you if you buy the reagent for hla b27 it's basically a cocktail it contains both hla b27 molecule and a antibody and also hla p7 antibody okay so those who are already doing hla b27 in your in your lab you may know that so if you buy the reagent or the antibody for uh, detection of hla b27 it's basically a cocktail of two antibodies one is anti hla b27 and the other is anti hla p7 okay why this anti hla p7 is given together with hla b27 is i'll tell you the reason because of cross reactivity okay so let's start so like any other analysis the what would be the first plot yes time plot time plot right very good so we'll just put time and the forward scatter make sure it's a stable acquisition yes it's uniform throughout so it's fine then we go for a viable plot right so viable plot is side scatter versus forward scatter Okay, so you can see there is a big debris, which may be some RBCs and so and so. Then you have the lymphocytes, you have the monocytes, and the neutrophils and some eosinophils. So what I'm going to do is just eliminate the debris, and get the other population. Okay, in fact, this assay is a very simple assay, so I'm be I mean, I'm uh, I'll be only focusing on lymphocytes, and then we need to draw the singlet gate. So it's forward scatter height. versus forward scatter area from a and draw the singlet gate okay then size scatter cd45 so these four plots i normally call them as universal plots some people call this as housekeeping plots so it's up to you to call with whatever name you like so lymphocytes monocytes neutrophils and eosinophils okay now the population which i'll be interested on for this assay is only this lymphocyte so i'll just get the lymphocyte and then i'll draw a plot putting two markers one is hla b27 see if you see this particular panel or uh, this particular markers only three markers are used one is hla b27 the other is hla p7 and then cd45 okay so now i'll put hla b27 and hla p7 okay Just quickly checking if there any problem with the compensation. Nothing is there. That's fine. Okay. Now HLA B twenty seven versus HLA P seven. Okay. Now you just divide this particular plot dot plot into four quadrants. Okay. So this is how the four quadrants are divided. Now this case is a case which is negative for HLA B twenty seven. Okay. Now. I have gated the lymphocytes. I mean, I have drawn a region around the lymphocytes, and I have gated it on HLA B7 versus HLA B27 plot. Okay. Now, this population is 
डबल नेगेटिव दैट इज इट इज नेगेटिव फॉर एचएल बी 27 एंड इट इज नेगेटिव फॉर एचएल बी 7 सो यू कैन फाइंड दिस रिपोर्ट एज नेगेटिव एचएल बी 27 नेगेटिव ओके इन केस इफ दैट पॉपुलेशन फॉल्स हियर ओके जस्ट अस्यूम दैट इफ द इफ द सेम लिम्फोसाइट पॉपुलेशन इज फॉलोइंग इन दिस पर्टिकुलर एरिया ओके then it is positive for hla b27 and it is negative for hla b7 okay and this you need to sign it out as hla b27 positive okay so these patient this is the case with hla b27 positive so the patient is having hla b27 allele expressed and these patients are more predisposed for ankylosing spondylitis okay so one when it is here you will call it as positive for hla b27 when it is here you will call it as negative for hla b27 now how about if it is falling in this area it is positive for hla b7 okay but it it is negative for hla b27 still but the uh, the aim of the assay is to just detect hla b27 so still we will sign the report out as hla b27 negative clear if you have any doubts please stop me okay now finally if the population is falling here okay now it is positive for hla b7 and b27 okay in this if the population is falling here you don't sign the report as hla b27 positive why because hla b7 can cross react with hla b27 antibody i repeat hla b7 protein on the cell surface can cross react with hla b27 antibody so it can give a false positive oh, i mean it can give false positivity for hla b27 so when you find the lymphocyte population falling in this quadrant that means it is appearing like it's positive for hla b7 and b27 you cannot call it as hla b27 positive you need to ask it is equivocal or you can say that it is not reportable you can ask suggest to do hla b27 by other method like molecular method pcr or something okay because it, i repeat hla b7 molecule or antigen on the cell surface it can cross react with hla b27 antibody and it can give you positive signal for hla b27 that is the reason why we have kept hla b7 in the antibody cocktail along with hla b27 because of this cross reactivity for instance if you don't have this anti i mean if you if you don't have this antibody okay and if you are just using hla b27 this hla b27 antibody what we are adding can go and bind to hla b7 and it can give positive signal for hla b27 so you will report it as hla b27 is positive which is wrong it's false positive because the hla b27 antibodies have an affinity or are binding towards even hla b7 molecules present on the cell surface okay that is the reason why you have hla b7 as a part of antibody cocktail in the hla b27 dhg okay so i repeat very simple just get the lymphocytes and get it on hla b7 versus b27 plot if you find the population here it is double negative you sign the report out report as hla b27 not detected or negative if the population lies here it means like hla b27 positive hla b27 is detected or positive if it is falling here it is hla b27 negative okay and if it is falling in this area then you need to say it is not reportable or equivocal and you can ask them to do hla b20 b27 assay by other method like a molecular assay okay so that is the reason why we have hla b7 along with hla b27 in the reagent pack okay because hla anti hla b27 antibody can non specifically bind to even hla b7 molecules okay so that is the reason why we have hla b7 in a reagent as a cocktail with hla b27 is that clear any doubts so since there was some request for hla b27 it's a simple as i thought like uh, just cover it theoretically but since it was asked and uh, i want to stress upon this cross reactivity of hla b27 antibodies with 
HLA-B7 and just showed you a live analysis. Sir, yes. Uh, sir, is there any cutoff to uh, for the positivity of H HLA-B27? Yeah, very good, very good. See, you really don't have a cutoff because see, HLA A, B, C, which belongs to MHC class 1 molecules are present in all the nucleated cells. It is not just your blood cells or the hematopoietic cells. You take any nucleated cells of your body, HLA, uh, MHC class 1 molecules are there and they all express this HLA, B and C. Okay, so if the patient is positive for HLA, B27, then all the cells, not only lymphocytes, monocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, so have all the cells will express that particular molecule. So you don't have an internal negative control here. You don't have an internal negative control as well as an internal positive control for HLA-B27. So what you can do is that uh, you can, during your standardizing your assay, okay, you can use a spiking with a positive control or, an, uh, or in case of a positive sample you get. Okay, there is commercially available positive control. So you can spike it up with that and you can set your gates. Okay, so that is one way of doing. But if you really want to search for the internal control in the sample itself, it is not possible. There is no internal controls. It's basically uh, if by the shift, you, you see the cluster falling here, so it is obviously negative. If you find the cluster falling here, it is obviously positive. But you cannot compare it with the internal controls what we do for other assays. Uh, so, if to drop the internal controls, uh, to drop the quadrants correctly, what you can do, you can spike up, spike up a, a control sample with a positive HLA-B27 sample and then you have two populations. One is a negative and the other is a positive of the spiked sample. Then you can set the quadrant and there and after you can acquire the sample in the same template so that you have already the template, I mean quadrant fixed in that. So, for which false here is negative, which false here is negative, which false here is positive and which false here is need to be checked with other methods and you can report that as EPO. Is that clear? Yes, so sir. What? But yeah. uh, if 30% uh, population is in the B27 and 70% in B7, then how to report? Uh, uh, sorry, come again. 30% in HLA, B27 HLA B27 and 70% uh, in B7. So you mean to say the population is like something like this? Uh, below the variable fish. Uh, uh, what is that you say? Uh, B, uh, B7 positive and 70% uh, and 30% B27. Uh. Something like this? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, now see this, uh, the, that is, again, if, if that particular population is falling in this area, okay, so you have a population 30% speaking into HLA B27 and 70% is negative for HLA B27 and positive for HLA B7, Still, I would recommend you to uh, give the report as just before the check for compensation. Okay, you check with HLA B27 is B7, HLA B27 is 45, and B7 with 45, all the three combinations. And if there is any compensation error, just uh, compensate it. But after adequately compensating, also if you get a population trailing from this area to this area, then again you can put the report as equivocal. But such instances are very rare. If you get it like that, just put it as equivocal and ask them to check with other methods flow will not be helpful. But the question what you are asking is very rare. Uh, such instances comes very rare. If your instrument is all perfect and your antibody reagents are all stable, uh, the instances of getting what you say is very rare. Yeah. Sir, how to check compensation errors? As you are doing it fast, I am not able to uh, get it. Okay. As a beginner, I will tell you, so you have attended the compensation class. But uh, the thing is that uh, if you are using a software or never a software, the best way to check for compensation is you check every marker with the other marker. For example, this is a very simple uh, say. So, like me, I'll show you. So, you draw a plot. So, uh, say for example, fit C, it's there, right? So, you, you fix fit C in the y axis. Then you change the y axis marker one by one. Say first HLA B27, check for compensation. Then you go for the other marker, third marker, ECD. Here it is blank, but still, if, if you have a fluorochrome, I mean, if you have an antibody in that particular channel, you check with that. So, similarly, you need to check with every, every marker with all other markers. So, that is a beginning uh, stage. You can do that. It, it takes time, but you gather experience. During a period of time, you know the expertise of correcting compensation by the pattern itself. Okay. Now, this is how you need to do. You put one marker on y-axis and x-axis, you change all other markers. 
check anywhere there is a compensating or a screwing of data. What we say like arrowing. Okay, then you need to correct. Okay, so this is what. If you have a software, then what you can do, there is an option here called add all plots. Okay, now if you just click that, the software will automatically give you all the combination of plots. See here. So now you can use this for also to compensate. Now you can quickly go through because of the software has already given you all the combinations, which we call it as N into L. All the combinations of various markers or channels and you can see whether there is any compensation. So this is a three color assay. So there is no much compensation. If it's a 10 color assay, obviously you will get a lot of compensation. Okay. So that's why you need to check for compensation. Have I answered your doubt? Okay, sir. Perfect. So that's it about the chili. I, I have one please, doubt also. Please, please ask. If 20% B27 is positive and 80% uh, is negative. Aha. All hypothetical questions. Actually, B27 is 20% positive and? And 80% negative, below. Yes, here. Okay. Mm. Yes. Now, how to report this? Ha, if 20% or 30%, 40%, is there any cutoff to and call it positive? See, you are saying about B27 or B7? B27, sir. B27, then it's something like this, right? Ha, yes. Yeah, again, see, that is again, see, normally, practically speaking, it's one lymphocyte cluster. So, you will never see the cluster falling in between the two quadrants. Very rare. Okay. It should be one cluster in the negative area or it's a one cluster in the positive area because there's nothing like dim expression of HLA antigens, HLA ABC antigens. They are well distributed on the cell surface. So when they are present, they will be normally moderate or bright. When they are absent, they will be negative. So nothing like dim expression. But theoretically, if you are putting such a question, my answer is if you find in case if you are, again, I'm really stressing on the point, like if everything is fine, your instrument settings, your QC, all other things are fine and there are your reagents, antibodies, everything is fine and still if you are getting something like this, then you need to again say it as equivocal and ask them to check with other other methods. But the, 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 the chances of getting the patterns what you are saying is very rare. Because if it is positive, it will fall here. If it is negative, it will fall here. That's it. Because there is nothing like dim expression for HLA ABC. Okay. Any other doubts? Have I answered your question? Yes, sir. Perfect. So, any other doubts? So, here on what I suggest you is that now you know about the basics of flow cytometry. Okay. Now, take all efforts to go and see the data. If you have an instrument, just take a chance to go and see every essay. If you don't have the instrument, wait for a chance. Or as I said to you, critically analyze the reports what you get from outside. Okay? And always keep on chasing. Definitely one day you will achieve it. That is something which, how I did it. So, I would strongly suggest that. Right. So, now what I'll do, I'll just close this and then we'll go for today's session. Okay. So, Today's session is the final session of this particular module or the course and uh, today we'll be dealing with a, a slightly dry and slightly boring topic but a very very important topic given the current status that every test or every lab needs accreditation for the test it's doing. Okay, the situation is not the same some five years back but now Whatever test you are doing in your lab has to get accredited, okay, for reliable results. So, so this becomes a very, very important topic, okay. Now, QC 
with related to flow phonometry is not something very new it is something very similar to all other instruments and other test what you are doing in your lab for example coagulation assays or your cbc assays or whatever whatever but in this lecture i will be stressing upon certain points and quality controls steps which is unique for flow phonometry okay so certain things which are common for all i will not be discussing because it is almost like for example a maintenance of an instrument okay so it is almost same the external cleaning and the, all those things are quite same for all the instruments okay i will be stressing here in this lecture on points which is related pertaining only to flow cytometry okay now so this is what we have gone through so this is our journey of uh, with the inception of this particular course for the batch 2 so we have covered around around 10 lectures we did with introduction then instrumentation of flow cytometry fluorescence and fluorochromes assessment one which was very good and the response was excellent then fluorescence spillover and compensation then antibodies and panel designing sample processing acquisition with the lab demo then sample analysis and live analysis of software so then we had an assessment too again it was a very good uh, performance from most of the participants then we went into practical assays or common assays like stem cell enumeration then pnh diagnosis then lymphocyte subset analysis and today hlb 27 so these are all common tests so if you have a flow cytometer you should be starting these tests directly you should not wait for anything once you are very good with this then you can go for even a finer tapping and later for uh, mrd assays and so on okay so finally today's class is about quality control and reporting guidelines okay so finally this is the one which is going to tell about your report quality to outside people okay so if you are very you should make this particular area very strong so that the report what you give is reliable and it is pertaining to the sample what is given to your lab and the report what you are generating out of it is of quality and quite reliable for the physician to treat the patient right now why do you need a quality control in flow cytometry so to make yourself ensure that the results what you are generating are reliable because as i told you the referring doctor is going to take some action based on the reports what you are going to give so it should be reliable okay and the report what you are going to give should reflect on the properties of the sample okay or should depend upon the sample and it should not alter due to the change in the instrument okay so one example is if you are running one sample if you have two flow cytometers okay and you are doing a cd34 enumeration in one machine it you are getting a value of 100 and in other machine you are getting a value of 150 okay then both the machines are not harmonized okay so then the results what you are going to give is not reliable which one will you release 100 or 150 there is something wrong with one of the two machines or both the machines are having problem so that is not reflecting on the properties of the sample at least any one one instrument is giving you a wrong value and similarly assay performance so you do a different assay and two different assays gives you different values then again there is a problem and reagents or the operator variation for example technician 1 performs a assay he gets a different value and technician 2 does the same assay though is it as per the sop you get different value then something is wrong okay so this should not happen whoever does the test whatever instrument is being used or whatever protocol it's being put in the practice okay on the reagents should give an harmonized value and it should reflect on the properties of the sample so that is the basic aim for of putting a quality assurance in the laboratory practice okay so that is a major objective of having quality control practice and quality assurance in your laboratory okay now this when you talk about the quality control it normally revolves around some five important areas one is the person who is doing the test or the person who is reporting the results second it's the mission or we call the analytical okay so the mission which is generating the data okay when the mission is not properly maintained if the mission is not having periodic qc checks 
and if it is subjected to some voltage changes or it is subjected to some other uh, uh, mechanical uh, uh, disturbances then you may have an altered value and uh, the results what it's being generated out of the machine may be wrong so you need to keep the machine perfect and put it under strict qc guidelines then the material when i say material it means the reagents okay when the reagents are not of quality okay the results obviously what you're reading out of it will be definitely abnormal or wrong so you should have a strict practice on evaluating the reagents what you receive for flow cytometry so again i'm saying this is not very unique to flow cytometry it is similar to all any other assay or test what is being done in your laboratory and then the methodology okay you should have a strict standard operating procedure that has to be followed when a sample comes into your laboratory for a specific assay okay everybody cannot do it in their own style okay there should be a strict standard operating procedure telling how the sample should be processed for that particular assay okay so that methodology has to be perfect and uniform in your laboratory and then the most common one is a sample so as you know the pre analytical errors constitute around 70% of the total laboratory errors so the sample or the pre analytical errors is a very very important thing. for example a transported sample a delayed sample okay and uh, in case a sample which is not meeting acceptance criteria so these all should be taken into consideration okay before you report as such whatever sample comes okay for business sake you cannot take it in and just run the sample and give some report out of it no that's not a fair thing okay so a lot depends on the sample also so the most of the quality control measures revolves around these five important areas okay now when let's see one by one now instrument so when you get an instrument you should have at least a basic knowledge of the configuration of the machine you should know how many lasers does it have how many channels are there okay is it a 10 color instrument is it a 13 color instrument or a 8 color instrument so only when you know that you know what all fluorochromes can be used in it what is the excitation of that particular laser what is the wavelength the laser is emitting light so at but so what are the fluorochromes that can be excited and what all detectors are there what is their filters okay so that the emitted fluoro emitted light of from the fluorochromes can be captured or not and what type of detectors are we using are we using a pmt detector or an apd detector so you should know in and out of about the machine okay so that is very important just you have a flow cytometer and you can't just to say like ah run run means if you don't know without that is a per hour important purpose of having a basic flow cytometry course before an advanced flow cytometry course because you need to know what is basic because the, the basic may be a bit boring everyone wants to start with leukemia lymphoma immunotherapy you know when you say why well, you want to do flow no leukemia lymphoma sir see if you want to do leukemia lymphoma then you need to know what is basics if without knowing basics no point of going for advanced one day will come where you will make a blunder okay and then similarly for all other instruments you need to have a maintenance log okay so the maintenance log saying what all things you need to do daily what all things you need to do monthly what all things you need to do six monthly and what all you need to do annually so and this has to be followed as per the calendar time points okay and each lab should have a documented policy defining the procedure for appropriate instrument function checks to be performed prior to delivery so as with our cbc so every every day before running the patient samples what we do we run the controls correct similarly for flow cytometry we have controls and these controls may not be as same as samples it could be beats qc beats or calibration beats okay so we run that every day in the flow cytometer and we check for three important components of the flow cytometer so during our first lecture we discuss right so what are the three important components the optics which constitutes the laser the filters okay and then fluidics which is the sheet fluid and the flow cell and then electronics which is constituted by the detectors of the flow cytometer so every day you run this qc beats and you check for the performance of these three important components whether they are optimal and are they giving results as desired or as per the qc norms and then once this is all satisfied you can go and put the patient samples okay then as i said you most of these QC checks are done by commercially available beads. So when I say you know what is beads, beads are small particles 
which is similar to the size of biological cells, but we can design it to the we can design it as per our needs. Okay, I'll tell you some of the QC beads uh, during our future slides. Okay, and they are very useful for monitoring and evaluating your instrument performance. Now, when a new instrument is set in your lab, like any other instrument, you have installation qualification, operation qualification, and performance qualification. So, installation qualification, you basically know the environment where the machine is being placed, so the temperature and so and so, the utilities, the electrical things, the the, the plugging, uh, like the points for the machine, the hardware, the computer system to which the instrument is interfaced to. So, all these things has to be checked after installation. Once installation is done, then we need to check the operation of the instrument. So, we need to check the software functionality because it's only through the software we'll be commanding the machine. Okay, the flow cytometer. So, whether the software is functioning, then operating system alerts, optical precision, you need to check the precision, like precision in the sense, like uh, when I say optical precision, it basically means the precision of the laser beam to hit the cell. Okay, and as you know, the laser beam should hit the cell at that particular point and it should interrogate at, with one cell at a time. Okay, so this optical precision and this precision is checked with CV percentage then the detector sensitivity, whether the detector is picking up signals, even if it is of a, a, a weaker signal, whether it is getting picked up and the laser power has to be monitored. And then if you are using an automated sample acquisition with a carousel, what we say, call it as an auto loader. In CBC, if you are using a bigger machine, you have something like auto loader, right? Similarly, in flow cytometer, if you have a good workload, you enable an auto loader where you can keep the samples in assigned carousel and then the machine will automatically acquire one patient after the other or one cube after the other. So this all also needs to be checked when a new instrument is being installed in your laboratory. Once installation and operation is done, then you need to check whether the instrument is performing well. That you need to check with optical alignment. Again, you check it with QC beads. I'll tell you in the subsequent slides how to check the optical alignment. Then the linearity, you know what is linearity. Linearity is the capability of an instrument to pick, pick up the lower value and also the maximum value. So the minimum and the maximum value that can be picked up by the instrument is called linearity. Correct? So similarly in a flow cytometry, the capability of the machine to pick up the lowest or the weakest signal and the capability of the machine to pick up the brightest of signal. So that has to be checked. That is called linearity. Then the detection efficiency. Detection efficiency is the capability of the flow cytometer to pick up the weakest signal. Okay. And similarly, electronic noise. Noise is something like a, it's a false signal. Noise is something like a noise which is being created without a signal. If you get a, or without, a, a, what say, a, without an emission hitting the detector, if you get a signal, that means it's noise. Okay, so I told you during our PMD, right? The PMD is a very sensitive detector and sometimes you get this electronic noise even though there is no photon beam hitting the PMD. So, this all has to be checked. There should be very, very low electronic noise. It's not, you cannot have a very high electronic noise which can affect your uh, analysis. Okay, and then the background signal, then the overall resolution and carryover. Carryover is like as with our CBC, you know, once one sample is run and then if you're running the next sample, uh, the carrier of the previous sample should not be there in the current sample. So, this all has to be checked and if it is only satisfying all these and uh, then IQ, OQ, PQ is done and the machine is handed over to you. Now, what we do normally in an IQ, OQ, PQ setting is that once the machine is installed, the application or the service engineer comes, he stays in your lab for two or three days. He completely finishes this and he gives a big booklet of IQ, OQ, PQ. We happily get that and keep it in our shelves. During NABL audit, if the auditor asks for IQ, OQ, we will show him. But the point is that once this is given to you, you need to check each and everything, whether it is correctly done. Okay, for example, optical alignment, is it correctly done? Was the CV percentage perfect, less than 2%? Is the linearity good? So all these things we need to check it. If we are not understanding you, please ask the service engineer to explain you how that was done. Okay. So this all needs to be done. For example, we had a uh, enable audit some time back. So uh, 
Tasha sir was very good, and she, I mean, she asked me like, was this water bath calibrated? I said like, yes, madam, calibrated, and with a lot of uh, confidence, I gave a calibration report for that particular water bath, and it was reported as calibration done at thirty seven degrees. Now Tasha sir asked me like, at what temperature you are using it? Uh, sir, for one for this particular assay, and uh, I need uh, to keep that test tube in the water bath at sixty degrees. So she asked like you are using at 60 degree, but it has been calibrated at 37 degree. So it should have been calibrated at 30, 60 60 degree, which is the temperature at which you are using it. She rightly asked me, correct. What I did is once they gave me a calibration certificate, I happily said like okay, fine, uh, that is done. But is it me meeting your utility? Is that calibration meeting your need? That you need to check. So these all things you need to have a look at it whether it is correctly done. It's not like when you get a big booklet and just keep it in the shelf saying like IQ, OQ, PQ for my new flow cytometer is done. That's not the way. So using reagents and software, company technical staff will optimize as instrument first. So all these will be done, as I said to you, for optimizing three components of your flow cytometer. The optics, the fluidics, and your electronics. So the optical alignment, optical alignment is alignment of your laser and the alignment of your filters and so and so. Then the fluidics. Fluidics basically means the flow of sheet fluid, the flow of sample into the flow cell. Then electronics, whether they are picking up the photons, hitting them, the detectors, especially the detectors picking up, I mean, picking up the photons, hitting them. Then the sensitivity and linearity. Again, it deals with the detector, whether the detector can pick up a very weak signal and the range of signal what the detector can pick, the, the minimum and the maximum. And then compensation. So these all will be done. And once this is all perfectly done, your machine is ready to use. Now, when you have a machine, there are something, as I said to you, there will be something like you need to monitor day to day, something on a monthly basis, something on a six month basis, and something yearly basis. For example, yearly is something like preventive maintenance, which will be done by your service engineer. Okay, six month or three months, once compensation can be done. Okay, the compensation, if you, are, if you have a well-trained technician, he can do the compensation with single strain controls. You know what is single strain controls now. Or the application specialist of the instrument manufacturer, or I mean, Beckman Coulter or BD, whoever, uh, whichever instrument you are using, the application specialist will come and he will do compensation for you. Okay, but there are certain things you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis with QC beads. Okay, so the, these QC beads, if you, you need to run it, daily to check whether the laser current and laser power is efficient, is the fluidics working good, is the optical alignment perfect, the PMT voltages are good and then fluorochrome sensitivity. So you need to run the QC beats and you need to check for all these parameters and the values of the PMT voltages and laser parameters are plot plotted on LJ chart to check the trends. Okay, now how this is done and what are the different QC beads available, I'll tell you. So the QC beads for checking these parameters, what I discussed, basically there are QC beads which almost does the same function but has different names based on the manufacturer. Okay, if you check, there is something called Spirotech 8P calibration beads which is being manufactured by Spirotech. There's something called CST beads, which is being manufactured by BD. Then you have Immunobride, which is a Beckman Coulter beads. Flowset is a Beckman Coulter bead uh, beads for uh, uh, they, uh, for their instruments. And Flowcheck, Fluorospace is again a Beckman Coulter QC beads for their instruments. Uh, this is I'll tell you what is the difference between these two. And there is something called DX Flex QC beads, which is used for Beckman Coulter DX Flex instrument. So these beads almost does a very similar function. Of course, there may be some beads doing an extra function and some beads which may not do that. But it is being named in multiple, it, it, it named differently because of the manufacturer. Every manufacturer, when they come with a QC bead for a, one particular instrument, they give a new name. Okay. And there are multiple beads. I'll tell you what are, what are these beads and what is its utility. Please don't confuse these QC beads with cell counting beads. Okay. So I told you that we'll be adding cell counting beads during enumeration assays, CD34 and so and so. So those beads are different from these QC beads. Don't think beads are all same. No. QC beads are different, counting beads are different. And the compensation beads, which is called antibody cap capture beads, are also different. 
Okay, so these three are different, completely three different beats: the QC beats, cell counting beats, or enumeration beats, and antibody capture beats or compensation beats. All three are completely different. Now, let's start with this uh, eight peak calibration beats. What we do this particular beat? Once you run in the flow cytometer, you get eight different populations. Okay, so basically, I'll tell you what is this. This Pyrotech eight eight peak beats are nothing but it has a mixture of eight beats of same size, but these eight different beats each each particular beats have fluorescent markers on its surface with varying intensity. For example, you have eight different set of beats as a mixture. One set of beats will have very high fluorescence. Okay, which say like for example, 100 times of uh, the negative or uh, the, uh, the dim positive, then you have 50 times, then 25 times, then 12.5 times. So something like serial dilutions, then you have eight different beats starting from the dim to the maximum bright area and they reduce in a periodic fashion. Okay, so you have eight different pop, uh, beats here. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so you have eight different beats in a mixture. Okay, and each beat, each set of beats will have specific fluorochrome molecules on its surface. Okay, and the concentration of this fluorochrome molecules on the surface it gradually increases in a different set of beats. So when you run it in the flow cytometer, you get something like this. You have one set of beats which is completely negative. The other set of beats is dim. The other set of beats will be slightly higher than the dim beat and exponentially it goes till the brightest beat where it's showing highest fluorescence because that beat will have multiple fluorochromes on its surface. Okay, so you run this and what you need to do is that you need to gate the seventh beat. Okay, and you label them as reference peak and you need to check the intensity of this particular beats for all the channels. And you also get a reference sheet along with the kit which will tell you whether it is falling in the range. For example, I'll tell you now I've gated this seventh beat. Okay, this is eight, this is seventh. So I've just selected the eight and I'm checking for the fluorescent intensity for all the channels. For example, FITC, PE, PERCP and PE, Psi 7. Now, for example, if the FITC, the reference peak MFI is 28,920. So you just check here. So 28,920 is within the range. That is 28,752, 752, 752 to 33,826. And this falls within the range, of course, on the lower side. But still, it is there in the range. So that is passed. Similarly, you need to check for all the channels. PE, again, you need to check. This is 36,000. So whether... How much is this is 32 to 38 and 36 falls in between them so it's within the range so similarly you need to check for each particular channel for the prescribed seventh peak okay so that is one advantage of using spirotech eight peak beats the other advantage is to check the linearity so i told you right it has eight set of beats each set has prescribed amount of and uh, uh, fluorochromes on its surface. Okay, so the one bead will have very low fluorochromes and the eight bead will have very high fluorochromes. So you, when you run it in the flow cytometer and get all the eight uh, bead, I mean eight beads with fit C, you get eight peaks. Okay, that is a, that is why it's called eight peak beads. And you can check, by this you can check the linearity. Okay, so if here you see that. This particular fit C chant detector is picking up the lowest signal, which is almost which is almost like negative, and it can also pick up the strongest signal. Okay, so similarly for all channels, you can check whether the lowest and the highest signal is picked up. If it is picked up, then it means like your detectors are functioning well and linear linearity is good. Okay, and you see. The ability of the detector to pick up the weakest signal is called sensitivity. So if, if a weak signal is picked, it is very sensitive. And similarly, a detector, when it is able to pick up a very strong signal, it is stable. 
we discuss this during our pfd pfd and photodiodes right so sensitivity and stability can also be checked with this eight big beats and as i said the linearity okay the lowest and the highest can also be checked with eight big beats okay now the same eight big beats or calibration beats can also used to adjust the gain or the voltage for example now this is an 8 big bead and actually the peak should fall in this area okay but due to some manipulations or something it is not falling in the expected area and it is falling in the lower side then you can increase the gain so that this peak will fall in the desired position so you are calibrating the instrument with the 8 big beads so that the signal what you are getting falls in the right areas okay so it can also be used as a calibration beads for adjusting the voltage or gain based on the instrument what you are using okay so this is a qc report of a dx flex instrument i don't know how many of you have seen a dx flex instrument so when you are using a dx flex instrument there is something called dx flex qc beads so you need to load this dx flex qc beads after putting the lot number once you load the qc beads the machine will automatically generate a qc report like this so the machine will automatically check for the laser delay it will check for the laser power so once the laser power is falls within the range and similarly the laser delay is within the acceptable range then it it is passed similarly every detector or every channel the gain is checked okay and whether the gain is falling within the target gain if it is near to the target gain and if it is correct then the qc is passed similarly mfi is also checked for every channel and if the mfi is falling within the target median then it is passed then cv percentage for precision that is also checked so once it, if this is all checked then it finally gives you a qc pass certificate once the qc is passed then you can put the patient samples okay so lot number then laser delay laser power then you get you can check the gain of the every particular detector you can check the mfi of the detectors for each channel and then cv percentage to check the precision and finally the qc is passed then you can go for it so this is something like a flow check pro used for navios instrument uh, every pc instrument again this has a mixture of three beads based on the size you can find a larger bead a very smaller bead and an in, in, in between another beads okay and uh, when you run this particular beads again you get signal in the 10 different detectors what you are using okay so basically here you need to check two things one is the precision that is reflected by the cv percentage the cv percentage should be less than 2% okay should be less than 2% if it is less than 2% then that means your your fluidics and optics are perfect so basically running these beads will check you whether your optical alignment is good or not okay when you have a very low cv then it precision is good optical alignment and fluidics are working perfectly okay so that is one thing and you can also check the mfi value of this particular signal normally this is a qc bead so you know that this qc bead should give you an mfi around 50 so you can check whether it is giving sorry 500 it should give an MFA of 500. So you can check whether the MFA is around 500. If it is following, I mean, if it's less than 500 and gradually every day it is keep on decreasing. For example, first day when you are running, it is around some 490. The next day it becomes 470. Then it becomes 440. And after a week it becomes 400. Then it means like the detector is failing. There is something wrong. Okay. So you, you should call the service engineer because you cannot repair these things you need to call the service engineer he has to fix the problem for you if you are not checking these things with the qc beads then you'll be running the samples and you will get uh, when the expected positive will all be falling negative because the detector is not functioning efficiently so that is the ultimate purpose of running the qc beads to check whether the instrument is having proper optical alignment proper fluidics and proper electronics or the detectors whether it is functioning or not okay And similarly, uh, this one I just showed you, right? Sorry. And once this is done, you can also have an LJ because the NA will ask for an LJ chart where the CV percentage or the MFI can be 
graduated on a daily basis and you can check whether it is within the range and moving in a up and down fashion okay so this also needs to be checked as per the new uh, i mean as per renewal guidelines so again there is something called flow set pro which is again a beckman kulter uh, qc bead which is used when you are doing something with assays based on locked protocols for example you are doing a cd34 enumeration or you are doing a tnp enumeration with the locked protocol what i showed you is all free gating okay i also told you that there is something called lock protocol where, where you already drawn the templates and you just acquire the sample you cannot adjust the gate and the value which directly comes you will give it up though it is not such a great practice because you need to check every time what is happening you cannot blindly give what is the value which is shown uh, finally so if if you are using those lock protocols then you need to run this flow set pro which is a beckman kulta bead so with, by running this bead you can check whether the values are falling within the range which is given with the kit insert that is with the beads okay if it is falling within the range then it is fine so it also has for fluorescent markers as well as for forward scatter and side scatter detectors so flow set pro of 3 micrometer fluoros pierce used in standardization of light scatter and fluorescent intensity of instruments okay and also to check the ability of the flow cytometer to detect particle size and detect fluorescent fluorescent signals at various wavelengths okay so flow set pro the earlier one what i said you is flow check pro which is for uh, which has to be done daily to check your optical alignment and fluidics based on the cv percentage and also it can help you about the idea on the detector performance based on the mfi this is used when you are using a locked protocol or if you want to standardize your scatter and fluorescent intensity of instruments so that you can know whether it is giving correct value and when you are using locked protocols like uh, your lefocyte subset analysis with auto set gates then this is this is very important okay similar to what i showed you there for dx flex qc beads there is something called for bd instruments cst beads which is cytometer setup and tracking beads basically these beads are of two size one is uh, smaller size which is uh 2 micrometer beads okay and the other is 3 micrometer beads the 3 micrometer beads gives you two signals one is bright and other is dim the 2 micrometer beads give you a dim signal so by running these beads you can again check the linearity because where you know that the instrument is picking up the dim signal as well as the bright signal then detector efficiency based on the ability to pick the dim, the dim signal the background fluorescence based on the shift of these signals towards the positive area electronic noise again the cv percentage of the peak will tell you about the optical alignment and the laser alignment the laser delays which will be automatically calculated when you are running these uh, beads then area scaling factors and pmt voltages now whenever you are running the beads as as similar to a uh, cbc qc or your uh, coagulation qc you need to run this qc beads in the qc protocol you should not run this in a sample pro, uh, as in a sample protocol there is something called qc protocol in your machine you need to go into that you need to type the lot number of the qc what you are using and then you need to run it now with that qc it will automatically adjust the instrument calibrate the instrument and it will come to the optimal state for analyzing the sample okay so this is very similar to the dxx qc bit so once you run this again you get a report like this okay whether the values what you got with the qc beads is within the acceptable range which has been prescribed or which has been described and if it is passed then you get a qc status as passed and you are ready to go with the patient samples so this is a report qc report of a cst bead cytometer setup and tracking beads which is used in uh, cantu and lyric uh, instruments of uh, bechtel dickinson okay and then very importantly this you know compensation okay so compensation we don't do it on a daily basis we do it basically on a six month basis or when there is a change in instrument settings or when the, uh, is setting in the sense voltages or when there is a change in the fluorochrome of the panel uh, then you need to do compensation and you know how to do compensation right you need to do it with single stain controls so once you do the compensation always take a print out of it and uh, keep it in the record to to make an evidence that you have done compensation and after doing compensation you need to check 
with the peripheral blood sample or a proof sample to make sure that the compensation what you have done is perfect. Okay, once compensation is set, you need to run a patient sample or a control sample and make sure that there is no spill, uh, fluorescence spillover in any of the channels. Okay, and you need to take a print of it, sign it and file it. So that is also needs to be done. Okay. Any doubts? Bit boring chapter, but still uh, kindly understand so that uh, you need to know all these things if you are using a flow cytometer in future or not. Any doubts? Okay, so basically these are QC beads like your con internal controls what we use for CBC and coagulation. These are QC beads. You need to run them every morning before putting the patient samples. These QC beads will check on the Three important quality of the or the performance of the three important components of your flow cytometer one is the fluidics the other is optics or basically the alignment of the lasers and then your detectors or the electronics once this beads checks the performance of these three components and it meets the desirable ranges which has been already described with the uh, with respect to the beads you will it will give you a qc pass status Okay, once the QC is passed, then you can put the patient samples. Okay, so those are the function of the QC beads. Now, there is something called internal quality control. Now, what is internal quality control is, for example, if you are doing a TBNK, okay, now as per the NABL standard, you need to run two levels of commercial controls, okay, which may be low and normal, okay, and you need to run two levels. You can't just say like my load is low, so I am running one level. No, the, the, some assessors may not accept that. So, you need to run two levels for TB and K or CD4 counts. Okay, if your lab is doing TB and K lymphocyte enumeration or CD4 count enumeration, you need to run two levels of commercial controls and the CD percentage between the difference between those controls value should be less than 10%. So, the CV should be less than 10%. If you have very high CV, then mean like your assay is not precise. So, the difference between every time you run it should be less than 10%. Okay, so that is for T, uh, TBNK or lymphocyte enumeration assay. With respect to stem cell enumeration or CD34 uh, enumeration assay, you need to run a commercial control because you don't have two levels of control for CD34. You need to run it and the CV percentage between day-to-day uh, -day, uh, assay should be less than 10%. Again, to make sure like your assay is precise and then you have to run it in duplicates duplicate them once you have stained it you uh, split it to two and then run it in the first item to avoid random errors and again this duplicates also should be less than 10 percent okay if you are doing leukemia lymphoma immunophenotyping you don't have a commercial control available correct you don't have a commercial control now for that what you can do you can have the in what I or normally see you always check for your internal positive control. For example, the blast is expressing CD19. So, if you want to check whether CD19 is actually there, you can check the B lymphocytes. Okay, for example, you get a case of BALL. Okay, and the uh, blast is not showing CD, uh, for example, uh, some marker like what can I say, CD10. You can check with the neutrophils whether CD10 is working or not. Okay, so always check the internal controls. Your lymphocytes are very important population and it will act as an internal control for most of the markers. It may not be helpful for some markers like CD34, but for other other markers, for T-cell markers and B-cell markers like 19, 20, 22, okay, uh, you have already internal control as lymphocytes in your sample and use them as internal controls, okay? So such internal controls are residual normal hematopoietic cells in the patient own sample, okay? And that, that can be added used as an internal control. It is recommended to do a single platform analysis for absolute counts, especially for CD34. If you are doing stem cell enumeration, always do a single platform method. Don't use dual platform. For lymphocyte subset analysis, it's up to you. If you want to be cost cutting, then you can do dual platform. But again, if money is not a problem, then please do single platform because it's more accurate. Then coming to the reagents. Until now, we saw about the instruments and the internal quality control and coming to the reagents are basically the antibodies. Okay, similar to other laboratory reagents, what you receive in your laboratory, you should have a register or an inventory to maintain the reagent which is coming. And when the antibody is coming into your laboratory, 
note down all the details of that particular antibody. Is that the same antibody you have ordered? And then you need to check the performance of that antibody. Okay? Then you need to put a label or something mark it like when it was opened. And all these things has to be done. And now, whenever a new antibody or an, uh, new antibody or a new lot of antibody is coming in, okay, say if it is a, a new lot of antibody which is coming to your laboratory, for example, now CD3, uh, FITC, you, you, you were using in your laboratory, and suddenly a CD3, FITC, when it is coming from the uh, purchase department, and you find that it's a new lot, okay. If it is a new lot with, and different from the one which we are using earlier, then you need to do titration for this antibody. Clear? Or in case if you are getting the same I mean, antibody of the same lot, okay, you cannot directly put into use. You need to check the intensity with some sample. Something like you need to uh, uh, use a, a sample, say for example a peripheral blood sample, with old CD3 fit C and then you again label the same peripheral blood with the new CD3 fit C and check whether both are giving same results as per the maiden fluorescent intensity. If they are showing same result, then you can use it. If it's a different clot, you can't do this. You need to do titration for the new antibody of a uh, new, new lot antibody. Understood? Any doubts? Clear, right? Okay, now this is cell concentration. I told you this, right? A recommended cell concentration used for immunophenotyping of hematolymphoid neoplasm is 0 0.1 to 1 million. Okay, so it is basically 1 lakh to 10 lakh. Okay, note that antibody staining is mainly volume dependent. The sample volume in the assay should remain constant. Okay, the sample volume should always be the constant. If the sample is too cellular, you dilute it to the uh, desired uh, sample volume by adding PBS. Or if the sample is very hypocellular, then you can spin it and remove the extra uh, a plasma or something so that the volume does not get more. Okay. For fluid FN aspirate, uh, fine needle aspirate and specimen with low counts, lower cell concentration may be used and restricted panels can be used. For example, now you are getting a very hypocellular sample and your panel has six tubes. Now you cannot run six tubes because it's a very hypocellular sample. Now you can select the important tubes which has to be run. For example, the B tube, T tube, and the lineage tube. And then you can run only these three tubes. Okay, and leaving out the other three tubes. You basically you what maximum you information you can give with minimal tubes has to be done. Okay, so that is one thing you need to do. And whenever you are reporting such cases where your number of tubes have been limited because of the sample volume or the sample concentration. When you are releasing the report, put a footnote in the report saying like limited panel was used due to the hypocellularity of the sample, something like that you need to put. Okay. And uh, uh, at least 10,000 total events should be acquired for each tube and, a and should contain a minimum of 500 events of tumor cells, blast or atypical lymphoid cells. Okay. So at least 500 events cluster should be there to call something as abnormal. Okay. So this is all, everything what I'm telling you is a, as per NAPL 112 guidelines for flow cytometry. Okay. Similarly for CD34 enumeration, a minimum of CD34, 100 CD34 positive events should be there. Should be counted. At least 100 CD34 positive events should be counted. If you have very low, uh, for example, uh, there is no stem cells at all in the peripheral blend. You cannot say like you have acquired around 1 lakh events, stop it and whatever CD34, some 10 events, 20 events you are finding, you cannot give a number for that. Okay, so you should make sure like you should acquire until you collect 100 CD34 positive events. Okay, so that has to be followed. So, accepting the sample again, it's, it's up to the laboratory to define its own rejection criteria. Okay, and for precious sample like bone marrow and CSF, you cannot reject the samples. Though it is not meeting the optimal desirable uh, things which you have been listed, if it is not meeting that standard, also you need to accept it, and you should take efforts to process the sample and give a possible interpretation. Say like, no, no, my the CSF sample should reach my laboratory in half an hour. Now this is two hours. I'll reject it. No, you can't reject it. You can accept it, process it, and try to give a report out of it. But 
in the report you put the limitation what is what was there so the sample was received in the laboratory after four hours of collection or something like that similarly bone marrow because these are precious samples doing a bone marrow is very difficult taking a bone marrow sample is very difficult similarly csf is a precious sample so you can't reject these samples as a peripheral blood okay csf sample should be processed within one hour or stabilized using a transport media like rpmi okay for pnh analysis of granulocytes should be ideally carried out within 24 hours okay so if you are doing on granulocytes it's 24 hours and for rpc it is 7 days this one we discussed in pnh viability testing you know viability for sensitive assays like cd34 you should definitely use viability viable dye viability dye 7 a 80 okay for example if you are getting a travel sample you get a lot of travel sample because you're working in a standalone laboratory standalone laboratory then you can use a 7 a 80 dye viability check because travel samples tend to have a lot of dead cells or you can use forward scatter versus side scatter if you're okay with it to eliminate the debris but the ultimate point what i say is for sensitive assays like cd34 enumeration or stem cell enumeration you need to use viability dye for other assays it is up to you whether if you want to use or not so routine viability testing may not be necessary it is recommended for specimens with high risk of loss of viability such as stored or transported samples fnac samples or disaggregated lymph node samples okay for in these settings you can use viability like because the dead cells can give you non-specific signal so it's better you remove them before going for analysis okay for cd34 enumeration 100 percent compulsorily you should use a viability dye okay now how do you do the analysis for with respect to any assay I'm, I, I, this this is this slide is general for any any assay okay so you should have an idea on number of events to acquire so as i said you if you are doing leukemia lymphoma immunophilia tapping the minimum number of events is fifty thousand. you cannot acquire just five thousand and uh, start give reports out of it then what is the gating strategy you're going to use say for example myeloma the gating strategy what lab commonly uses cd38 versus cd138 so such gating strategies has to be put in your sops and how do you enumerate those populations so that has to be put in the standing or standard operating procedure so you should always have an habit of checking the internal controls which which is the normal cells residual cells along with the abnormal cells okay so you should check the internal controls whether your antibodies are on added and they are giving signal okay then you should exclude the doublets so i told you some housekeeping plots right the time plot then your viability plot the doublet plot okay all these has to be used ideal to have all possible permutations and combination of plots this is what the question was asked right how to check for compensation so you need to check for compensation if you use all permutations and combination of all the markers then definitely you can pick up where is the spilling or spillover happening then you can correct it okay so it's ideal to have all permutations and combination of markers cd45 versus side scatter gating is must so again this is again a housekeeping plot or an universal plot which is your fourth plot which is the, should be there for any assay ishh protocol is ideal for cd34 stem cell enumeration which i described and uh, uh, taught you uh, a couple of classes back then cd45 cd3 gating is essential for cd4 subset enumeration so you cannot say for example i want to cut the antibody cost so for cd4 enumeration directly side scatter cd4 and what all events showing cd4 can be taken for, as cd4 positive cells you can't do that because monocytes can also show cd4 so you should get out the t cells and after getting out the t cells you need to check for cd4 enumerate them and give the final count you cannot directly use side scatter and cd4 to enumerate the cd4 positive cells without cd3 that is wrong similarly threshold threshold determination of positive and negative population by using quadrant shall be based on the knowledge of internal controls for HLA-B27, you rightly ask like how to draw the controls. Now for HLA-B27, I don't have an internal positive control. Okay, or an internal negative control in a positive case. So in that setting, it's difficult. But most of the setting, you have an internal positive and a negative control already there in the sample. You should use them. Okay, controls such as unstained cells or isolated controls are suggested, but have limited use or therefore not essential. For example, for a negative setting up a negative quadrant you can use unstained cells but 
it is not a very very uh, encouraged uh, thing to use and for leukemia lymphoma always use a comprehensive panel of antibodies if you are doing because don't have a very stingy antibody panel which may result in wrong diagnosis say for example i have uh, i am um, uh, having a by morphology or suspecting it's a lymphoid blast and you are not using any myeloid markers okay just to conserve antibodies then you are committing a error there so you should have a very comprehensive panel of antibodies because certain things can be missed when you are using a very stingy panel then you should have a documented panel you cannot change your panels for every other sample for example if you have a pall panel that has to be employed across all the samples or if you have an acute leukemia panel that panel has to be used for all the cases where you encounter blast you cannot day by day change the panel say for example yesterday but there was one panel which was used by a colleague and you don't have good relation with the colleague you want to change the panel and you want to have your own panel you can't do that if you are working in a laboratory you should have a very common panel and everybody should use the same panel because your compensation everything is fixed to that panel you can't change the panel day to day it's good practice to prepare antibody cocktails when i say antibody cocktail what does it mean is if i am using a 10 color flow cytometry and uh, for one tube again dropping every antibody one by one there may be a drop in error you uh, because you work in the dimmer light or the area with no light because you are dealing with fluorescent markers so it's better you add all the markers and prepare a cocktail all the 10 antibodies together and make a cocktail and every time you can take it out from the cocktail and add it once to the sample whenever you are doing the assay thereby you can minimize the drop in errors but there is one problem with antibody cocktail is you need to prepare it fresh every time say for example on a weekly basis or a 10 day basis or a 15 days basis you cannot prepare an antibody cocktail and use it for months together that will give you problems you can pre prepare small aliquots of cocktail use it and again you need to prepare fresh so for CD34 enumeration, I told you that we need to use class 3 anti-CD34 monoclonal antibodies. We should not use class 1 or class 2. Okay, class 3 is ideal because they are resistant to the two enzymes, neuramidase. Okay, so you need to use class 3. Okay, and PNH analysis, you need to give the sensitivity of the assay. Whether you are doing a routine analysis or a high sensitive analysis. When I say routine analysis, that means like your threshold of detecting PNH clone is 1%. So it is fine if you acquire only 50,000 events or even 10,000 events is enough to detect a clone of 1%. But if you are doing or claiming yourself that you are doing an high sensitivity PNH analysis, then you need to pick up as low as 0.01% and the number of events what you need to acquire will be now higher. Say for example, you need to acquire 5 lakh events. Okay, so that also needs to be considered. So, PNH diagnosis only based on RPC analysis is not recommended. I told you why. Right? So, if you do only an RPC analysis, if the patient is having active hemolysis, all the PNH RPCs will get hemolyzed. And the residual RPCs which is there may be normal RPCs. Or if the patient has had a transfusion, now this wall will alter your size of the PNH clone. So, you need to do PNH analysis first on the leukocytes. If the leukocyte is showing positive for PNH clone, then you can check it on RBCs. So, leukocyte is the first thing. Flow cytometry assessment of HLA-B27 shall be done with at least two different antibody clones. But what I show you today is only one antibody clone. So, what I need to say is you need to use two HLA-B27 clones. So, what I showed you is one clone. Similarly, you need to use one more HLA-B27 of a different clone. But I don't think how many people are doing it. But this is as per the NABL guidelines. Okay, now this is one problem with cocktail making, what I said. So, if you prepare, see day 0 it is beautiful, day 1 it is fine. But if you see day 7, as the days progresses, you can find some compensation errors happening because of some dye dissociations. Because all the dye fluorocarbons are kept in one tube. So, there may be some interactions there. Then, you know what is EQAS or proficiency testing. So, currently, there is available EQAS provider for CD34 positive stem cell enumeration, flow cross match, lymphocyte subset analysis, leukemia venophenotyping, MRD for ALL, MRD for CLL, myeloma, and PNH. Okay, so some of the bodies which are offering this is NK Equas, RCPA, and College of American Pathologists, that is CAP. Okay, 
TMH is giving, uh, uh, um, they are not anyway accredited, but they are giving samples for MRT for ALL and uh, immun immunophenotype. Okay. If you don't have, these are all very costly because these are all, uh, because we don't have something like uh, 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 an ECOS provider in India for these flow cytometry assays. TMH is there, but they are again, they are not anyway accredited ECOS provider, but still they are giving samples for uh, uh, leukemia, immunophenotyping and MRD for ALL. In case you, you cannot enroll into any of these organizations, then you can do an interlaboratory comparison where you can just interchange the sample or you give your sample to the other laboratory and check your report with their report. They should be enabled accredited basically, which is very similar to all other uh, uh, thing what we do for other assays like uh, being done in our laboratory. If you don't have equals provider, then you can go for interlaboratory comparison. If you have a test which is not being done in any of the labs nearby, then you can do split sampling. Okay. So equals from accredited PT provider is not there, then you do interlaboratory comparison. If interlaboratory comparison is also not possible because you are doing a very rare assay which is not being done in many laboratories around, then you can do split sampling in, within your lab. So finally, when you are generating a flow cytometry report, the report should bear all these things. It's very important. Okay. So it should be the name and the type of the instrument you are using. So if you are using an Navios, it should be a Navios instrument and how many color instrument, how many laser instrument is that? Then the software you used for analysis. Then what is the cell preparation method you have used? Was it a stainless wash or a light stain wash? Okay. Then antibodies used in for the assay. You need to list out all the antibodies what you have used in the assay. Then number of events you acquired. For example, in email lymphoma phenotyping, if you are acquiring 50,000 events, you need to tell it is 50,000 events. Events acquired is 50,000. And when you are doing, as I said, for PNH, if you are doing high sensitivity PNH analysis or you are doing MRD analysis, then you need to tell about the limit of detection and limit of quantification. Okay. So this is something which I cannot explain you now. So beyond the thing. Then the gating strategies. As I said you for myeloma, the gating strategy would be side scatter CD38 and other gating strategy would be CD38 versus CD138. Okay. Then interpretation of the markers, whether it is positive or negative. Okay. See, uh, it, is, it is not just enough if you call positive or negative, especially in a setting of leukemia lymphoma. You need to comment on the intensity of positivity. Whether it is dim, whether it is moderate, whether it is bright, you need to comment on the intensity okay percentages if you give it's fine but if you are not giving that is also fine because nothing is going to be done with the percentages only the intensity of positivity has to be mentioned in the report final impression should be clearly stated along with the differential diagnosis okay comments and suggestions regarding other ancillary techniques to be done or any uh, information you want to give to the clinician should be put in the report so that are important things so these are some model reports okay so you have the sample, what is the sample you used, what is the antibodies you used, what is the method you have done, okay, name of the instrument, what is the software you have used, events acquired, gating strategy, and finally the results. Okay, so similarly for MRD, you need to give something called the sensitivity, which is based on your LLOQ, lower limit of quantification. Okay, so basically, what is the least number of cells that can be picked up by your assay is the sensitivity of the assay okay similarly you need to give about what all i said you antibodies the mission what you're using the software the gating strategies the number of events you acquired all these things have to be come into play okay so sometimes when you're even if you're not having, it's it's good if you give the percentages but nothing wrong if you're not giving it what is more important is the intensity of the markers when it is positive okay this is more important okay so again, here you find that just comment on the intensity of the markers, nothing beyond. It, you can give the plots, it appears more attractive, but again, this is an add-on. Really, it's not needed. Okay. So finally, the final report is a consolidated report with a clinical history in short, morphological findings if available, then FCM data, and if you have a lab with cytogenetics and molecular, you are you can also incorporate that in the final report and give a very final diagnosis as per the WHO and then you can suggest something which you want to add up to the clinician okay then one hour 
what about the data backup so for example histopathology they store the samples as paraffin blocks similarly for flow you have the fcs files but now this fcs file should be saved for up to 10 years you can't say when the patient is coming and asking you can i get that file i want to send it for a second opinion it's not much happening now but mark my words in future people will be coming and asking you the raw files of flow okay because many people are getting trained in flow and many people are starting doing flow now they will be asking for lmd files and fcs files so you should preserve it for 10 years you can't say no no man, that has been lost uh, you can't say that okay analysis plot on which the final diagnosis is made shall be stored in pdf that's a very good uh, thing because if someone asks for a clarity you can open up the pdf and you can show them but the raw file should be saved for 10 years the lab may consider giving the lismore data files to the patient on request which i said to you now for obtaining a second opinion or a treatment elsewhere this is not very frequently happening but mark my words it will be very very frequent as now patients asking for paraffin block or slides this will come into practice very soon because many flow labs are coming up many flow cytometry people are been many people are getting trained in flow cytometry as and definitely this will be very important fine so so that's it about the quality control and uh, so as a beginner you start here uh, definitely you sh you will be reaching a lot of heights just chase your dreams that is what i would say if you have want to do flow cytometry just be behind it some people may have access to the machine and uh, for them it's fine you can slowly improve on it and you can start new assays and can slowly come up people who don't have the instrument you just have the desire to do it uh, just hold it tightly you will definitely get a chance to do it it's it's just opportunity what you need and you will definitely get it okay so my best wishes to you all and i tell you what if you have any doubts any time anywhere you can just ping me a message i am always there to help you out if you have any doubts don't hesitate it may be related to a report or it may be related to some of your markers or your assays or anything you can just give me a message i am always there to help you when i am free i will give you a reply so i uh, wish you all success thank you and uh, the upcoming courses is like uh, there is an advanced flow cytometry which is going on which is for leukemia lymphoma immunophenotyping myeloma and mrt okay so there it will be more advanced where we'll be discussing on only the uh, immunophenotyping of leukemias lymphomas myelomas and mrt detection and there is also one more course which is coming is diagnosis of flow cyt inborn errors of immunity by flow cytometry uh, where it will deal with lymphocyte subset analysis phagocytic defects immune dysregulation and other diagnosis of pds by protein expression so these are some up upcoming courses so if you are interested you can join us and with that thank you so today we are finishing this course i request you to submit the assessment 3 results so that um, i can just collate that with assessment 1 and 2 so if you have any doubts you can ask me So, Dr. Sai is asking, like, what is the shelf life of antibodies after opening? See, any antibody has a shelf life of one year. Okay, one year. And it also depends upon how you maintain the antibody. If you are uh, keeping the antibody in a, uh, no, if you are if you are keeping it safe in a uh, no, not much uh, eliminated area, if you are not putting it to physical uh, uh, damage or something, then any antibody you can use it for one year that is what after one year you can again you it's not like you can throw out the antibody after one year you can check whether it is functioning okay is it giving you desired results if it is giving then you can use it still after validating it yeah any other doubts any other doubts if there is...